Good afternoon. Uh, once again, I'd like to welcome everyone here on behalf of the Institute of National Affairs. First of all, I'd like to remind everyone that um, our week of lectures will be coming to an end tonight with a performance by uh, comedian Jimmy Tingle. He'll be performing at uh, C.Y. Stevens Auditorium at 8 o'clock p.m. tonight, and um, the admission is free. Next, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panel. Um, They'll be discussing drug testing and the constitutional perspectives thereof. First of all, on my right is uh, John Dorowski. He is the chairman and professor in the Department of Health Promotion and Human Performance at the University of Toledo, and an attorney who teaches sport law and the physiology and psychology of motor activity. His books include legal issues in sport and physical education management and motor learning principles and practices. Next on his right is Pat Malloy. He is also an attorney and teaches courses in legal aspects of sports, sports management, and facility management at the University of Michigan. His books include Law and Sport, Liability Cases in Management and Administration, and Organizing Policy for Interscholastic Academic Athletic Programs. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I'm coming across on the microphone okay. When uh, John and I had been asked to, to do this, we had promised the committee that we would give a strong and diverse pro-con argument regarding constitutional, constitutional issues in drug testing. Uh, we traveled together here to Ames, and the more that we traveled, we found that we were starting to agree with one another. So I've tried to stay out of his view for the last couple of days. In approaching drug testing, I thought it was very appropriate with Ramsey Clark's discussion last night, which, by the way, I found to be an extremely compelling discussion. I hope for those of you who were there, you found it the same. I think whether you agree or disagree with his views of constitutional applications that we would all agree that he serves as a great national conscience and for me really set the tone for what I consider a contrast in how John and I are going to approach this today. He posed last night, if you'll recall, when he talked about the First Amendment, he says, I'm an absolutist, meaning that he took in the area of the Constitution, specifically with free speech, the idea that what it means literally is what it means literally. He used it to say the Congress shall not pass any laws which shall abridge free speech. Now, in our legal system, we have bought over the last 170 years the idea of interpretation of the Constitution. Many of us are aware today that candidates for the Supreme Court are evaluated on their basis as to whether they will construe the Constitution liberally or where they are, a la Robert Bork, a strict constructionist. And last night, Ramsey Clark gave us a new theme and said, should we go back and take it at its literal word? I think in approaching areas of drug testing, that type of contrast between shall we interpret the Constitution or take it at its literal word becomes very applicable. We are going to contrast for you today what we call administrative drug testing. We are going to talk about drug testing done by school officials. We're going to talk about drug testing done in the workplace. There are two pertinent amendments. We will touch briefly on the Fourth Amendment. If I may paraphrase, the Fourth Amendment prohibits the government uh, without just cause or no, I should caution, without warrant, prohibits the government without warrant from unlawfully searching or seizing items within your home or your person. We will be talking about the 14th Amendment, two concepts, number one, defining the right to privacy uh, as it applies to drug testing. 
and defining due process as it applies to drug testing. I guess the contrast we would present is that you could look at John Jarotsky, who I will note I consider a strong constitutional scholar in the area of drug testing, and say, here's the legal scholar. And then you could take me, a small town public defender from the state of Indiana, and say, here's the jailhouse lawyer seeking constitutional redress for his client, because I think that's kind of the way we may approach this. We are not going to reinvent the wheel for you. We have agreed there are certain precedent already set in the workplace and in the schools regarding constitutional issues. So we're not going to take the point of view that let's throw out all the precedents that have been done because it can't. But I think we are going to approach it from the concept that John, in looking at constitutional issues, has said we haven't done a bad job. We're not perfect, but we haven't done a bad job in setting up constitutional safeguards in this drug testing element, whereas I, being more the reactionary and probably a little more emotional, wonder whether we haven't rushed to judgment, if I may borrow Mark Lane's title on his book on the Kennedy assassination, if we haven't rushed to judgment in terms of constitutional application as it regards to drug testing. So I'd like to introduce my friend John Jarotsky. Thank you very much, uh, Pat. He told me uh, last night he was going to brand me as the fascist approach, and his was the uh, more open and free, free approach. But <laughs> uh, that's what happens when you. Uh, when you spend a few hours together in the car and try and uh, work out what, uh, what you're going to say and then uh, work out here. What we're trying to do is to stimulate some thought. Uh, as Pat has suggested, we are staying within the parameters that have already been established, but both of us feel that there's some future decisions that need to be made, and by following what goes on with drug testing, uh, maybe it'll help us when we get into a discussion of that. And when we summarize it at the end, we will... Uh, point out what we think some of the concerns that really merit discussion uh, are before we get into a reaction and say that's, that's the way that it is. So the Fourth Amendment, illegal search and seizure, has rather limited application. It's uh, limited to criminal cases, and the courts have pretty well said that uh, this limited application can be overcome by the use of warrant or uh, with probable cause. For example, if a car is stopped and a policeman uh, comes in and he sees a package of a suspicious uh, thing laying in the seat next to you, uh, he doesn't uh, need a warrant to do that. Further, the state can often uh, prevail by showing some kind of compelling uh, subordinating interest so that uh, when the state shows a, an interest then it, too, may overcome some of the constitutional limitations. Probably the more important thing to keep in mind when we talk about these administrative things, and we're using primarily athletics because it has so many interesting issues uh, to it, is the issue of privacy. A privacy deals with state action again. Is the person a, a state actor? And courts have held that the NCAA and Ohio High Athletic Association, Iowa High School Athletic Association, Michigan, or whatever the, the association is, is not a state actor. For example, the NCAA is a voluntary organization. People can get out of it if they want. They don't have to be members. They may not be able to participate in the NCAA championship, but they still have the freedom to be or not to be a member of the NCAA. The NCAA and other associations, therefore, can make rules and regulations that are consistent with their purpose. So if you read the stated purpose, most of these things say something about um, equalization of competition or fair competition, uh, develop the program for the health, safety, and welfare of the participants, and to prevent exploitation of athletes. The NCAA Constitution, Article 2, Section 2, for example, says the principle of student-athlete welfare. 
Intercollegiate athletic programs shall be conducted in a manner designed to protect and enhance the physical and educational welfare of student athletes. Now let's think about that for a minute. Institutions have just finished recruiting football players. We just had the National Letter of Intent signed. Shortly in March, we will have the finish of the March Madness. And after that, uh, some people would say we have April insanity when the coaches are out trying to sign all of the, the basketball recruits. When these people come into the institution, there's a tremendous pressure to win. Think about how you balance the budget in an, in an athletic program today. How many institutions really do fund an athletic program totally from gate receipts. We're talking about gate receipts, television, and then uh, student fees to help supplement. There's only a couple uh, that I can think of, University of Michigan, Ohio State University, that really totally pay for their programs uh, through the user fees, if you would. And I think there's what, five or seven nationwide that you could say operate in, in the black. So for most institutions, what we're talking about is reduction of the deficit. How do you reduce the deficit? You get on television. How do you get on television? You have a winning team. How do you have a winning team? Well, you don't go out and teach them new recruits how to play the game. You get people that are already able to play. In this kind of situation, there is a lot of pressure to win on the student athlete, and many athletes then will attempt to look for ways that they can get that competitive edge. For some, it's been said that the competitive edge then is the use of drugs. If we look back at the purpose for health, welfare, educational enhancement, then the institution has a obligation to do something to minimize or prevent the potential for drug abuse and for uh, illicit types of behavior. Consequently, we have the establishment of a variety of drug programs. They have the education. We have consent forms where they agree to participate. And part of the agreement to participate is agreement to participate in drug tests. Uh, coupled with this, then, are programs where if the person tests positive, uh, there is a retest. And if the retest is also positive, then there is some kind of a counseling or education or drug uh, abuse treatment program. And <clears throat> there should be then some kind of follow-up with this. Now, to have the privacy invoked, there has to be some kind of reasonable expectation of privacy. I have to be able to reasonably expect that I am a private person. What I do in my own home is private so long as it stays in my own home and I don't beat my wife or my children, okay? But as soon as I leave the home, this right to privacy becomes reduced. Privacy means that a liberty is not guaranteed absolutely against deprivation, but only against deprivation without some kind of due process or due cause. With the drug testing programs where we have consent and the kids know that either in high school they're going to be tested or they know that in college that the NCAA is going to require it, the conference might require it, the school might require it, and for them to participate, then they must be consenting to the drug testing. In the NCAA, for example, there's a random test throughout the year, and then after each postseason or uh, the championship competition, there is drug testing of, of the teams. You know going into the program that that's what's involved. You don't have to enter the program. You can say, I choose not to participate in interscholastic athletics. That's no different than being ineligible for other reasons, is it? If you don't make the required grade point average in ACT, what happens to you and participation in athletics? Proposition 48, you don't get to participate for a year. If you don't maintain your grade point average throughout the competitive season, what happens? You're suspended or terminated from the team. 
if you refuse to wear safety equipment, you're thrown out of the game. If you break rules, you're not allowed to participate. So drug testing, looking at it this way, as a part of the integral part of the program, it is devised for the health, welfare, and safety of the students, seems to fit within the constitutional gambit. If we look at employers, employers also have a reasonable expectation that their employee will show up in good shape and will do reasonable work. Drug testing, then, is another condition of employment for an, for an employer-employee relationship, just as proper equipment, use of safety equipment, use of tools. There are some conditions when public welfare is at stake. If we look at the transportation industry, such as bus drivers, railroad uh, pilots, we have a concern of Congress, which is twofold. One, to make laws relative to the public welfare, and second, for control of, com of commerce. As I mentioned, liberty is not guaranteed absolutely. It's only against deprivation without due process. And when we talk about the public good, then we're talking about establishment of ordered responsibilities. People are put on notice, and part of the due process is notice of of this situation. I'm going to stop right here. I think I've about run out of time. Uh, I have a little bit to uh, respond to Pat, and since he's had all my notes uh, for two days, uh, he's, he's loaded. <laughs> we're, uh, we're building in rebuttal. John's going to get, I get to rebut what he says, and then he gets to rebut what I say, and then I'm going to rebut again what he says, and sometime you'll get some questions in there. Uh, if I may refer again to Ramsey Clark's talk last night, remember he said uh, he doesn't watch television. And I kind of hung my head when I thought about me and watching all the Cheers reruns. <laughs> and John, after listening to your discussion, which I think you did or attempted to portray fairly well the law as you see it, I'm reminded of the refrain between Norm and Cliff, and Cliff has made one of his idiotic statements and Norm with the other people in the bar have given a very cogent, concise argument why Cliff was wrong, and it's now Cliff turn to rebut, and Cliff turns to Norm and says, well, Norm, you're wrong. <laughs> what are we saying, or what is our perception when a person is tested in the workplace or to school, and they test positive for drug use. Now, that, that's a whole gamut of things. I'm not giving you the type of test that's been administered. I'm not giving you any of the parameters with it. But a person who's tested positive for drugs, what does that say to his family, to his co-workers, to the general public? It says, I'm a drug user. The unfortunate part of drug testing procedures is they may not always tell you or they may not be able to determine. Number one, in fact, was it a drug, which John quite appropriately will address later on, that is prohibited from ingestion or use. It doesn't tell you, are you a committed user? Have you been caught on an occasion all it comes across and says, you are a drug user. And I believe that the constitutional application addresses two parts of that. Number one, when you're identified as a drug user through a test, there is a constitutional implication. If we again are to refer to Mr. Clark's talk last night, when a person is identified as a drug user, are we to believe that that particular information would not be used or would not be kept by a governmental agency against that particular person? And could that information not later on be used for purposes of search and seizure or probable cause for later search and seizure or indeed self-incrimination? Because drug tests say I'm a drug user. That's what it tells you. The other problem with drug tests is it leaves that lingering perception of drug use. We see that in professional athletics. Roy Tarpey, 
is unfortunately an aggravated scenario with that. Otis Nix and the Atlanta Braves. All instances of where the lingering perception is that they are drug users, and you come to any conclusion you want. In my mind, that is the gravamen problem of, of drug testing, and as you apply the Constitution, we've got to remember, under the Fourth Amendment, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to read the Fourth Amendment for you, but I do want to paraphrase. The Fourth Amendment says, and drug testing, by the way, is lawful under the Fourth Amendment. It says you may not drug, or you, the Fourth Amendment says you may not intrude or search and seize without a warrant. What we've done in the area of drug testing, as we've done with many of our constitutional applications, is we have dismissed the warrant concept, saying that you need to go to a neutral magistrate who will determine whether or not there is a reason, in this case, to drug test. And we have watered it down to what I would call two notable exceptions. One is the reasonable suspicion in administrative drug tests. Let's define administrative drug testing, meaning that's testing done by your employer or that's testing done by school officials. Administrative drug, drug testing. The courts have upheld pretty much the concept of reasonable suspicion. If your employer or if the school officials have reasonable suspicion, that a party has used drugs, that party can be tested. That's the gravamen. I'm, I'm sure that John can give me some other areas to uh, consider, but that really is the gravamen of that issue. The other thing we've done is that we have looked at the type of industry that you're in and we've said, look, you know, there are such things as closely regulated industries. For our purposes, that would mean, are there some industries that are so important to our health and welfare that the employees should be drug tested as a matter of general welfare or safety. The transportation industry is an example. The fire and police are an example. We came across last night that says jockeys are an example. People that ride horses, they're an example. You know why? The courts have said that the regulation of horse racing is so important that the expectation of privacy that jockeys have is diminished, and you should have the right, because it's a closely regulated industry, to go in a drug test. I would pose to you they're going to do that to athletics, or that's the, 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 they will make the attempt to do that to athletics. I have a tough time discussing with students where in the terms of national welfare, health, and, and everything else, athletic really fits that, that we can justify the derogation of a constitutional application. The privacy issues under the 14th Amendment, basically what they're saying is this. Look, you have an expectation of privacy under the 14th Amendment, and you don't give that up by an unreasonable search or seizure under the Fourth Amendment. If you give up your right to privacy, it's got to be done by a reasonable search and seizure. Fourteenth Amendment privacy expectation issues are, number one, type of job. We just talked about closely regulated industry. Are you in an industry uh, that's uh, of such importance under health, welfare, and safety that the employee should expect that drug testing will be done? The second is, and this is where you have most of your challenges, is the method of testing. The most noted method of testing in collegiate athletics requires that you urinate while being observed by another person, and in many cases in an unannounced test. Third area of privacy issues deals with if you have a test of an individual and that test is positive, what becomes of that information? Who knows that that person has tested positive? Who is supposed to be kept in the know and who's not supposed to know? Those are all very real privacy issues that have been upheld by the courts that if we go into the concept of, well, all searches and seizures are constitutional or we don't have to deal with a strong area of warrant or why it was issued that we have trampled on those three areas. Finally, 
I'd like to talk about the issue of consent. I frankly don't differ with John on consent. I'm of the belief that there are certain industries and there are certain areas of our endeavor where if you are fully advised of your rights, and if you are fully advised of the consequence of your failure to agree to a drug test in a school setting or in a job setting, and if you understand all the rights and consequences there under, that then when you give your consent, you've probably given it voluntarily. The problem is that in many of the consents that we both examined and agreed to, those protections aren't there. We talked about one consent form where, if you remember, John, what it noted. It noted at one item, the information derived from this drug test will not be given to anybody. No, I have it wrong. It said the drug inf we have the right to give the information from this drug test to anybody we see fit. That's the gravamen of it. Then a couple of par uh, paragraphs down it says, however, we're going to keep it confidential. And then the culminating phrase was, however, in any event, you can't sue us for giving the information out. That is not a voluntary consent. That is not, in my mind, what's protected under the Fourth Amendment. We both also discussed and agreed that uh, a consent form that was utilized by a Big Ten university when it tested its athletes noted what the athlete got was rules and procedures, one, two, or three pages, and then it got a separate page that was the actual consent form, meaning I, I agree to this uh, condition. And the condition said in the one-page consent form, in consideration for the opportunity to participate in intercollegiate athletics at, at the Big Ten University, I am entering into the terms of this consent and authorization, period. The athlete has said right there, I will, in consideration for a right to play, agree to be drug tested. What we found is that the policy that was sent with the consent noted under a section B, which I assume or hope that the athlete read, that the refusal to provide a urine specimen will be considered a positive test result. When the athlete signed the consent form, what did the athlete agree to? I agree to take the drug test so I can participate in athletics. Did the athlete agree in the consent form and understand that if he doesn't take the test, not only can't you play athletics, but we are going to consider your refusal as a positive test result, and my question is, who gets that information? Whether or not you took it, it goes down as a positive test result. We need to be cautious when we talk or when we generalize about the areas of privacy and when we generalize about the areas of due process because I'm of the belief that you can establish the basis for drug testing, but it's only now that we're starting to realize all the constitutional implications under Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment. John now gets a short period to rebut me and, you know, take that for its worth. Well, Nam, you're on. <laughs> You know what they said about the Smothers brother, Brothers, uh, mother always loved me more than you. So you can figure out which one's uh, which. You know, it's an uh, interesting, uh, Pat, that you just uh, suddenly realized that we live in an imperfect world. Uh, if we had a perfect world, we wouldn't really need courts. So uh, we have to do the best we can in these imperfect uh, situations. That's why courts are here, to look at the imperfections and to try and uh, convince people to polish them up and clean them up or to at least point out their, their wrongdoings so they know what, what's doing. I agree that not all the uh, consent forms and policies and procedures that are followed are, are necessarily uh, up to muster, con uh, constitutional muster, but people are beginning to straighten these up and the ones that have been approved 
are up to muster. I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, I can't believe that uh, you actually think that uh, the University of Michigan or Toledo, when a student tests positive, is going to have a direct modem link with the uh, feds and uh, send this up to DEA. Uh, the programs do indicate that there is a confidential relationship. If the person does have a positive test, they're not flagged right away. There is a second test given to check and see if this is indeed positive. If it does turn out that both of them are positive, there is a confidential report to only those that need to know, the uh, athletic uh, personnel that need to know because of the eligibility, and then the person, either a medical doctor or a counselor who needs to work with them with the drug abuse program. There is confidentiality uh, in the, under those circumstances. That's not information that is given to, to the federal government or the state government. You raised an interesting point about uh, TARPLY. Uh, if you were comparing TARPLY versus John Drawatsky, I'm not sure that the whole world knows uh, John Drawatsky. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure that, uh, that people really care. However, uh, Tarpley is a rather well-known individual. Courts have distinguished the difference between private and public individuals. Private individuals have been treated entirely different with release of information than a public person. When a student is suspended from school or athletic uh, endeavor or whatever, it doesn't say druggy suspended. It says a uh, student uh, may be suspended if it or a person is ineligible for some, <clears throat> and it's usually non-disclosed reason. Consequently, I'm not that concerned that uh, the federal government is going to have access to, to all of these files, uh, such as you, you suggested. As I mentioned, we don't live in a perfect world. Per a person that's going to use drugs is going to go to all kinds of uh, links to try and hide the fact that they use drugs. I'm reminded of a story of a fellow that was uh, six foot eight and uh, he weighed about 280 pounds, was a, a uh, uh, power event person. And he was drug tested. Drug tests were perfectly clean, except there was one little odd thing uh, with this drug test. No drugs, no drugs, just female hormones. It seems that uh, you can buy a package of clean urine uh, for $50 on the open market, and they were using catheters. Uh, there, how, do, how do you prevent uh, these kinds of things? Well, you have to uh, have somebody there to observe the, the specimen to make sure that the, the collection is done as it should. And again, people are told how the collection is going on. Uh, there's not an expectation of privacy when person is warned ahead of time that it will be, be known. Prosser, who has been cited by the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, said that there are four things which lead to an invasion of privacy, four manifestations. And I'd like to just bring these back to your attention. One is intrusion into the plaintiff's seclusion. If you're out playing sports and doing things, you're not secluded. You're out in, in terms of other people. The second is a public disclosure of embarrassing facts. If we don't put out a banner, so-and-so suspended because of drug use, uh, we're not disclosing <clears throat> uh, these facts. Publicity which places the plaintiff in a false light. Uh, certainly that doesn't apply to this situation either. And finally, appropriation of the defendant's uh, name or likeness for some kind of financial and advantage, and that's not it either. So I would say that privacy is not invaded with the drug test, particularly with notice and explanation. You know, for years, what we've been dealing with, practically 200 years with the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, is some kind of a compromise. Rights and responsibility is a two-headed coin. You have certain rights, but your rights end when my rights begin. And society often in, will tolerate intrusions into an individual's privacy under circumstances similar to this in your analysis. And that's been 
upheld for a long time. When an individual leaves his home and interacts with other people, then the competing rights of other individuals will collectively take precedence and as individuals take precedence. I think that we have a adequate protection for the drug testing. It serves an educational and societal function and that it's not what we need to be concerned with. We need to c concern ourselves with making sure that all the policies are in line with what has been established. It seems to me that when we talk about our right to privacy, as put forth by John, it would be the right to privacy will be objectively evaluated by the governmental agency or by the agency who is doing the testing. And I would pose to you that the right to privacy is a subjective test. When they determined that a student was not required to go in on an unannounced test, no knowledge of a previous test, was not required to go in on an unannounced test stripped to the waist down while being observed and give his urine, I would pose to you that the reason the court dismissed that particular test was they said subjectively how does that student feel when called upon to urinate where do you urinate don't do it in the hallways why do we have the concept of toilet facilities in the first place the right to privacy is a very subjective thing the concept and term expectation of privacy refers to what do you as the citizen have in terms of expectation? See, John and I basically will agree that if there is an announced test and if it is done in an appropriate procedure, that the drug testing is probably a reasonable search and seizure. But where we disagree, it seems to me, is the part that says that expectation of privacy guaranteed under the Fourth Amendment I would pose as a subjective matter, not an objective matter. Uh, I don't want to play the boogeyman with where the information goes. I, uh, for those of us who are products of the 60s, we tried that game, it lost. The question isn't, will the government get the information? The question isn't whether the DEA will get the information. The question under right to privacy is who within the university family has access to that information? The courts aren't looking to say, well, it's all right as long as the police don't have it. The courts are looking who within your school or who within the workplace has it. Does your co-worker know that you tested positive for drugs? That's an expectation that you have a right to. That's your right to privacy, that your co-worker doesn't know I tested positive for drugs. So I'm not quite as um, uh, scared about the police or the government as I'm worried about my next door neighbor. And under our interpretation, I am constitutionally guaranteed under the right to privacy that my neighbor won't know that because that's my expectation of the right to privacy. Having contrasted, probably rather flamboyantly, some of the differences we have, we want to close before we open for questions with some issues that we do agree upon and concerns that we do share both about methods, processes, and areas of drug testing. And uh, I do have to defer to the scholar in this one. There's probably no one better who can sum it up. <laughs> one of the reasons that we uh, look at sport rather than, uh, than just, say, the ability to stay in school is that the court has distinguished between privileges and rights. Uh, education has been defined as a property right that once you provide it for anybody, you have to provide the, the same kind of thing for everybody. And consequently, while you may be able to expel somebody permanently from a private school, you cannot do so from a public school because a public school has to be there for everybody. You can have temporary suspensions such as two weeks. Extracurricular activities such as sports have been viewed 
<clears throat> by the court as a privilege rather than a right. Even though some people would say it's my right to try and get a, a good paying job in the NFL or the uh, NBA or what have you, the courts have consistently said that this is a privilege. And so it falls under a little bit different gambit than what you see with a, with a fundamental right. Uh, there are a couple things that we want to do. We, we were trying to uh, work out a way to stimulate your thought and to uh, frame some arguments, particularly because of things that we see in the future. Before I get into that, anybody read the USA Day? Uh, today, yesterday, there was an article in uh, about Aber Albertsville, and it was a chilling aftermath of cold medicines, and they went through the number of cold medicines that if you take, you will uh, end up positive. So you may not want to uh, take these before you go on a drive. Um, Sudafed, Dristan, Sinex, Formula 44, NyQuil nighttime cold medicine, uh, chlorid triathlon, uh, there's a lot of them. And if you look at the uh, in International Olympic Committee or NCAA or any of these, there's lists of hundreds of substances that uh, are banned. And so these things then may not be banned, but they give either precursors or substances that would be banned. Well, what about the reliability and precision of the test? The most frequently used test is the cheapest test. And when we start talking about testing hundreds of times at an institution or thousands of times across the country, we're talking about a lot of money. The cheapest test is not the most reliable test. The urinalysis that is most commonly used will give a lot of false positives and it will also give a lot of false negatives. What about the people that are positive but have a false negative and are never picked up. If we start talking about drug tests that will accurately predict these things or pick out these things, we're talking about expensive, expensive testing. What is the role of the reliability, precision, and cost factor when we're dealing with drug testing? We look at other things that are coming on. If you've been following uh, the news, uh, there are a lot of diseases or conditions now that have been picked up through genetic testing. Muscular dystrophy, as an example, a manic depression with mental illness. How about uh, if we give a genetic test at the time the child is born to see if there are any of these, uh, these conditions, or once you uh, reach your first employment to see if there's any of these conditions. And your insurability is based upon pre-existing pre conditions, right? What, uh, what happens if we go to genetic testing to determine the presence or absence of things that may cost and uh, your insurability or inability to uh, get insurance or a job or whatever? <coughs> or even closer to home, what about HIV today? What if everybody has to undergo a mandatory HIV? HIV doesn't, uh, doesn't really raise concern until somebody comes down with the symptoms of AIDS, right? What's the biggest age group that's coming down with AIDS? It's 20 to 30 years of age group. When does that mean that the HIV virus was, positive, was uh, present? It means in the teens. What do we do with the ability to test HIV, and other things. Most drug problems are not with athletes. If you look at the incidence of drug problems, athletics, particularly at the NCAA and high school level, is really a very small problem. There are far more drug problems among the recreational bodybuilders than there are among athletes. There are far more drug problems among the general population of students than there are among athletes. Most institutions today have rather intensive and pretty effective uh, drug programs with their athletes, but these don't exist for regular students or recreational athletes or lifters. What kind of obligations are there for that? Should all students be tested? If we're testing athletes, should everybody in the university be tested? Should there be a universal drug program? 
Well, uh, these are things that we'd like for you to think about, and we've tried to stimulate some thought by taking two different uh, approaches. But we found out that on the way over here, we really didn't have that much to disagree with, so we had to uh, work very hard on, on trying to set two, two extreme things. Uh, we'll, answer, we'll answer questions that you might have about our presentations or about the current laws, and I'd like to give one plug here. Uh, Dr. Gary Gray is the uh, editor of a journal here, Legal Aspects of Sport. And uh, this happened to be an issue that I guess is why I got here. Uh, there's, a, there's an article in here I have on uh, drug testing, whole loaf, half loaf, or no loaf, where I talk about the uh, court cases that have dealt with the uh, NCAA. So if, 